Welcome to Insights, a Canadian Journal of Political Science podcast. I'm your host, Liddell Hastings, with technical support from Abel Amba. Today, we are joined by Olivier Jacques to discuss the topic of deficit or austerity bias, the changing nature of Canadians' opinions on fiscal policies. This article was also co-written by Eric Belanger. Insights by the CJPS can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. To keep up to date on the CJPS, follow us on Twitter at CJPS underscore RCSP. So welcome to the CJPS. I'm joined by Olivier Jacques. Um, and why don't you start off with introducing yourself, your relevant work, and, and kind of what brought you to the subject we're talking about today. Yeah, thanks for uh, the invitation. Uh so uh, I'm a political scientist, uh, but I work uh, in uh, the School of Public Health of the University of Montreal as a, an assistant professor. Um, and I'm broadly interested in um, fiscal policies, um, health policy, social policy, and how people uh, think about uh, these uh, these different uh, policies. Uh, and, and I've been uh, influenced by, by real world events, uh, obviously. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, my, my interest into austerity and fiscal policy uh, uh, started with um, the um, Quebec government's austerity measure during the, the, the tenure of Philippe Couillard um, from uh, 2014 to 2016. Uh, they were quite stringent austerity measured measures that, that resembled a bit what, uh, what Europe has, has, uh, has been through after the financial crisis. Uh, and, and more generally, my interest is on, uh, on the politics of welfare state retrenchment. Uh, which definitely comes from uh, my experience with the uh, student strikes uh, against the tuition fee increases in 2012 uh, in Quebec. So, so I, most of my research are, are on topics that I just find interesting because it, it relates to real world events. And uh, on that specific uh, subject, I, I team up with uh, Eric Belanger, who's a specialist of economic voting and, and political behavior, to uh, study what uh, what Canadians think about. Um, deficits and austerity okay and then and kind of how did you come up with this with this research question specifically like measuring the austerity versus uh deficit kind of rewards for for approval ratings and things like that but what kind of spurred the uh the inspiration yeah well uh w- one of my question was uh how can the the government of 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 canada um how was the government of Canada able to sustain so harsh austerity measures uh, during the 90s uh, and to sustain uh, budget surpluses? Uh, we've been one of the rare countries uh, to sustain a 10-year sur- surplus from 1997 to 2007. You know, usually when you have a budget surplus, there are multiple demands everywhere for the government to spend more and spend more or reduce taxes. But the government of Canada has been able to sustain this budget surplus after having implemented very, very stringent austerity measures during one of the worst recession we had in Canada uh, in the early 1990s. So I was wondering, like, how was it possible to sustain this, considering the fact that people are supposed to dislike austerity? And then, like, how could actually Justin Trudeau completely switch course? Because, you know, in, in the 2015 election, I think with the with the one of the most brilliant moves of the Liberal Party of Canada was basically to say, well, we're going to do deficits. This, this idea that we cannot do deficits and that we always need to sustain or to aim for a budget surplus uh, is not relevant anymore, according to the Liberal Party. And this helped them p- to position themselves more to the left and to, uh, to be the NDP as the, the main alternative to, to the Conservatives. Um, and so, uh, so I was interested in in in, in this, uh, and and more generally, I've been working with um, a colleague, uh, Lucas Haffert, uh, a German colleague, uh, who's a postdoc in Zurich, uh, and he um, we we worked on on the effect of austerity measures on popularity of different uh, OECD governments, and so I was I was I wanted to to see what was going on in, in Canada in this particular situation where we've been from a situation where. Governments were never able to balance the budget before the 1990s to a situation of sustained surpluses and people that seemed happy about it. And then back to a situation where the party that says we're going to do deficits is winning the elections. And and what specifically, what does this paper add to the literature on like austerity and and deficit uh, and approval ratings and all of that? 
um, conclude? Like, what does it add? What does it change? Or, you know, go ahead. Yeah. So, so first, well, there's definitely contribution that, like, you know, say GPS papers. Often, you want to do something that you show something that has never been shown in Canada. So that's the first contribution. Is that uh, uh, most of the studies of uh, the uh, on the popularity of Canadian governments have ignored fiscal policy. So we've we've seen already some studies on whether or not like recessions influence government's popularity, uh, but but none of these studies, to our knowledge, except like quite old ones uh, that that didn't use a, lo- a, a, a long time series. Um, most of these studies ignore fiscal policy, so that was one of the first uh, contribution. And um, also the other contribution is to think about like, well, so is the what's the public's preference? Uh, are they uh, actually in favor of austerity in the sense that they want a um, uh, uh, balanced budget? Or do they have this deficit bias uh, that the most of the political economy literature suggests that, uh, that the public uh, are kind of uh, uh, myopic? Uh, they, they just want more spending, less taxes. So actually... Budget deficits is what they want, and they don't really care about debt because debt is like in the future. Uh, so, do people think like like this, or have they been convinced by the discourse that has been dominant uh, uh, until uh, Trudeau went to office that uh, we needed to balance the budget? Like in the ARP years, there was no question uh, that we were gonna try to balance the budget. It was definitely the case that we were gonna try to balance the budget. This is what was gonna what was gonna happen. Uh, so that that's the the main contribution, trying to you know study Canada and trying to know actually what people think and do their European change over time, and does it change with elite messaging or with a broader policy paradigm of like the you know the the main uh, uh, ways that policies are, are are designed, what the main objectives that the governments are trying to achieve? Does this influence public opinion? And what, what, you know, you, you cover a little bit in the paper, what's your kind of theories about the causal mechanism that made people buy into this? Because you're going from governments that, you know, are either lowering taxes or keeping them the same and increasing social spending and services over, you know, if you want to take this broad period, maybe post-World War II up, up to this time period. But then you're selling, and now you know, to win an election, you're selling that you're going to balance the budget and be more fiscally prudent and all of that kind of argument. How, how does how does that switch happen? And, and how did how do voters buy that kind of buy that argument? Do you do, would you say? I think I think this is the this is the more, most important part uh, of the paper. So what we show is that um, from so we have data that starts in 1978. Uh, so from 78 to and it's quarterly approval data. So we have the government's popularity every quarter, and we have uh, the fiscal the fiscal balance of the government every quarter. And what we're showing, and and, and the, the different economic uh, measures like unemployment and inflation, etc., what we're showing is that from 1978 to the early 90s, uh, when deficits were increasing, government's popularity was increasing as well because people add a deficit bias. Right? They, they, because when deficits are increasing, it means that government is spending more, taxing less, basically. Um, and um, But then there is a huge crisis in the early 90s, and that changes people's mind. Um, so we have, like, in the early 90s, like, the, 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 the we, we kind of t- tend to forget that, but, like, the situa- the fiscal situation, of especially of the federal government in the early 90s, was cat- catastrophic. Like there was something like uh, more, I think like a quarter of all expenditures were basically just paying the interest of the debt, which was just rising all the time. Uh, the, the the level of public debt was extremely high, uh, like at least twice as high as it is now uh, for the federal government. Um, and governments were never able to balance budgets. Uh, and at the same time, there was a huge economic crisis. So unemployment was up. Inflation was also quite high. Uh, and um, there was uh, the IMF was basically knocking on Canada's door uh, with a structural adjustment plan, like a bit like what Greece had. So it, it wasn't cool. Uh, and there was also like a crisis in Mexico uh, that that led to a, a crisis of the Canadian dollar at the same time. So we're seeing clearly at the time like uh, deficits, debt, 
becomes the most important uh, issue for Canadians, like more than healthcare and the economy. Uh, and so governments have been like responding to this. Uh, and then they completely changed the way that budgets were managed. It became much more centralized towards the Ministry of Finance uh, that was then able to basically impose cuts on everyone. Uh, and they also uh, made substantial cuts to transfers to the provinces. So basically, austerity was transferred to the province, uh, to the provinces. And um, and then all the, 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 the main objectives of the government, the policy paradigm that leads fiscal policy completely changed. The goal was to balance budget at all costs, reduce spending, uh, um, keep taxes low at the same time. Uh, and, and this then also influenced public opinion. This is our argument that from then, uh, the, 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 the effect of budget deficit switched. So now governments are rewarded when they reduce deficits, whereas it was the opposite before the 90s. And we're clearly, clearly seeing this in the data so that when deficits increase, popularity uh, uh, goes down uh, from, from 1993, something like that, until uh, the mid 2010s. So basically until uh, Trudeau comes to office. So maybe the deliberal read into public opinion uh, that uh, people were ready for a change. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, you know, different movements like uh, the 99, 99% versus 1% movement occupy Wall Street, the idea that inequality was a problem, uh, uh, et cetera, that, that really uh, changed. Uh, and so there is a, a clear break uh, in the early 90s that fits with public opinion, then elite message, messaging that like really put uh, the idea of austerity uh, front and center. And I would say convince people that austerity was uh, a good idea and the main objective that fiscal policy should pursue. Right. And so what? where does, if you're the average person and you're feeling, let's say, inflation going up and you might see some of the effects of having a, a large debt on uh, in the economy and, and things like that, how much of that, how much of that structural environmental plays a role in, in the change of a public opinion versus the elite messaging. Obviously, you still need the elite messaging to te to advertise austerity as the solution to the economic problems. So that's the second step. But how much, how much did actual on the ground circumstances impact? Do you think, or is it more the elite messaging uh, in driving in changing the public opinion overall, or a combination? Yeah. Well, it, it's we can't disentangle what comes first. Like, is it that public opinion made the paradigm change? Right. Or an, an elite messaging change, or is it elite messaging and a new paradigm that's that shifted public opinion? It's difficult to 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 really disentangle, but definitely that public opinion was favorable to a sh shift in the policy paradigm in, in the early nine in the early nineties to move towards an austerity agenda, and then this policy paradigm has been sustained by elites uh, until uh, the, the the Liberal Party came to office, because clearly right now. I would say that despite the fact that the conservative are saying that, you know, the liberals have been making too, too, too big deficits, I'm not sure that there is such a strong appetite to go back to an austerity agenda. Although it's true that I think the, the conservative have tried to uh, uh, match the high inflation with a, uh, a deficit, government deficit. But I mean, I don't know. Well, first, this argument is false. And so I don't know how like how much people are actually influenced by it. But definitely, uh, and that's another paper that's related to this one that we, I wrote with Eric Belanger too, that, that shows that inflation really influences popularity. So regardless of deficits, right. uh, like inflation is really important for a government's popularity uh, because a, a lot of people are, are influenced by inflation, which is different than unemployment because unemployment pretty much influences just like the people that lose their job. Right. Whereas inflation influences everyone, so definitely that uh, the one of the drivers of the uh, lower popularity of Justin Trudeau right now is high inflation. Uh, but I'm not convinced that deficits are a driver right now because what our data was showing, we don't have like the 2022 data in the paper, but we're, we're stopping before the pandemic. But definitely that like in in the last years of our data set deficits are 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 
are not influencing government's popularity. So it, it can the effect as as we went back to some extent to a deficit bias, and that fits with elite messaging. Like now, the elites, like uh, the Liberal Party, has been saying, "Well, deficit don't, doesn't matter so much because we're not raising debt so much before the pandemic." So I mean, um, I think now it's really a question of of inflation that influences uh, popularity. So, so that that leads to a good transition, and and this can be more speculative um, on what impact COVID has had on if if you just extended the years of this paper maybe up to yeah twenty twenty two. Do you see the Trudeau errors as a blip within this deficit? Oh, uh, sorry, us, um, yeah, deficit, um, rewarding deficits. And, you know, with this high inflation, with all of the debt that incurred over the duration of COVID, do you think that the public can be sold on a, on an austerity argument if the conservatives go down that route in an official policy plan, whenever the next election is? Yeah, well, if the if the conservatives are able to uh, convince the, the the population that 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 um, inflation is driven by deficits, maybe. Um, but I, I I've been very surprised actually by uh, what the government has been doing during during the COVID crisis. Like it 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 really went further uh, into the change of paradigm than what I expected. The sense that uh, the the Liberal Party of Canada has been the most left wing party that we had in office since Trudeau the father uh in terms of fiscal policy it's 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 pretty impressive like they they actually made uh, poverty lower during the pandemic like this this is very impressive uh, and so they spent like crazy but like people were less poor during the pandemic than before the pandemic this is this is impressive uh and and they cut children poverty in half like structurally so, I mean, they decided to move away totally for, from an austerity agenda. Uh, it's interesting how they don't get so much credit for it in the sense by the left. Um, but um, so, but it's true that there may just be a backlash afterwards. So is it a, a durable change of paradigm or Poiliev is going to win and like go back to an austerity agenda? We'll see. But it's interesting to see that in, in the last two elections, Especially the last one, like the the Conservative Party was was not at all proposing an austerity agenda. Uh, they 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 really went back from rather than like in the ARPA years, they would definitely have said we are the ones that are going to balance the budget. And yes, we're going to cut stuff, but like this is like spending for the moochers or whatever, like useless spending. Now they like Aaron O'Toole did not say that at all. He said like we're going to balance the budget in ten years, which is basically we're never going to balance the budget. <laughs> Uh, so we'll see what what Poiliev is gonna is gonna is gonna say now, um, but uh, that, that's we'll see we'll see. I, I don't know what's gonna happen there, but like it's it's not clear that to me that there's gonna be a backlash and back to an austerity agenda after COVID actually. All right, just finishing off with a little bit of a inside baseball questions about methods and things like that. Um, do you have any advice about? you know, creating time series data and uh, maybe even a, if there was a hiccup along the way or a lesson you learned, anything like that. Yeah, well, um, what, what's I, I think funny with that paper is, to be honest, what actually happened when I was uh, researching it was that we were uh, we, we were writing a chapter for, for a book uh, that with Eric Belanger and I, a book that's commissioned by, by some uh, very famous scholars in, in, in the literature of economic voting that want to do a new book on economic voting in the 21st century in multiple countries. And their argument is that economic voting is declining over time. The idea being that the effect of economy on government's popularity was declining. Um, and so we were doing the Canada chapter. So I was playing with the data and I was like, ah, I'm interested in fiscal policy. So I'm going to put fiscal policy in the data. And then I, that, that's where I found the effect. So it's a bit inductive. It's le less cool than my deductive theory that I present in the paper. But still, like, I mean, you, you, you look at the data. I tried to kill the effect I was finding all the time. Like, I mean, you, you, you try different methods, this rolling regression that basically, like, looks at a, a, a smaller time window to see if the coefficient changes, uh, tested for structural breaks. Uh, and clearly, like, there was something going on there. And then it clearly fits with all the discourse we had on, on austerity. So 
you know, sometimes I, I would guess the, the advice is like, don't be shy of when you have a data set playing with it. It's not like fishing for effects. It's just looking for what's actually in your data set. What's, what's the da data telling you? And the data will tell you a story maybe. Uh, and, and then it's just about being rigorous and making sure that you're not like picking up something that doesn't really exist. But in this case, I'm sure that it exists. Like this, this, this change of the coefficient over time of the effect of deficits on popularity is just too strong to be uh, an artifact of statistics. Like it, it, it does exist. Uh, and so, I mean, advice, method, methods, advice is like play with your data uh, for a long time. <laughs> and then you may find the uh, uh, interesting things. Okay, that's a that's a great place to end on. If there's any kind of uh, ending remarks or self promotion, uh, here is the floor. If not, um... uh, well, uh, thanks for for the invitation. I don't know how I, how I should self promote myself. <laughs> Apart from saying that we have a new paper coming up in social uh, in uh, in um, Canadian Journal of Political Science with uh, Daniel Bélan, Patrick Marie, and Shannon Dinan on, um, on uh, the, the social policy of the Coalition Avenir Québec government. And our argument is that the Coalition Avenir Québec government has actually governed quite to the center uh, in terms of social policies uh, since it has been in office. So uh, check out, uh, it's going to be uh, published quite soon in uh, Canadian Journal of Political Science. It has been accepted recently. Okay, great. That's, there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's exactly uh, the type of thing uh, a uh, academic podcast would uh, would have as in terms of self promotion. Uh, so thank you for joining. This has been another episode of the CJPS, uh, and hope to uh, have you all listen uh, in a couple of weeks when we release another episode. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Insights, a Canadian Journal of Political Science podcast. This was Olivier Jacques discussing the topic of austerity and deficit bias. For future episodes, follow us on Twitter at CJPS underscore RCSP. Or subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. If you want to support the CJPS and its podcast, we welcome any distribution of our episodes and further reading of the articles discussed.